What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so what I want to do here is I want to cover, I haven't done that intro for a while, so, so what I want to do here is I want to cover Superman Red Sun. But the cool thing about this is that as it was originally released, it was done in three volumes. It was like Red Sun Rising, and then Red Sun Ascendant, and then I think Dawn of the Red Sun or something like that, I can't remember. But nonetheless, we're actually going to cover the three volumes, and we're going to do it in three separate videos. So Superman Red Sun was written by Mark Miller, and it was designed to turn the concept of Superman on his head. And it was really cool because it had never really been done in this way before. There have been stories where Superman was Russian, but it was never really expressed or never really thought out to its fullest extent in a huge three-part series. Instead, it was usually like an old school story where it was like, you know, a standard 20-page comic and the day was saved at the end and that kind of thing, or it just turned out that Superman was captured by the Russians and tricked into being a Russian or something along those lines. But it was never like this full, you know, what would happen if Superman landed in Russia and how would the whole superhero landscape of the world look like if Superman was Russian? You know, what would Russian Batman and, you know, all these different characters be like? The fact remains, that the cool thing about this what mark miller does is he delves into a lot of history now the way the story opens up is it really deals with a lot of people panicking and a lot of people freaking out and in fact president ike uh, president eisenhower actually addresses the nation directly and what he basically says is that there's a new age dawning there's a new era coming about where the entire conflict between russia and the united states is changing and the cold war is going on a collision course that will result in the destruction of one of their two nations and in a lot of ways it does but to sidetrack here for a second for those of you guys who are not really familiar with u.s history russian history world history, the Cold War was this war between the United States and Russia that lasted decades. But the difference, and the reason why it's called the Cold War, is because the United States and Russia never officially went to war. Instead, we really just had what were considered to be proxy conflicts. Now, the reason why the United States and Russia never went to war is because both countries were amping up their nuclear weapons program. And that's why it was such a huge deal back then, because if the U.S. and Russia had gone to war, it would not have been a war of artillery. We wouldn't have invaded Russia. Russia wouldn't have invaded us. It would have just been MAD, MAD, mutual assured destruction, meaning both countries would have just launched nuclear weapons and destroyed each other. And so that's why the Cold War was such a huge deal. But when it came to the start of the Cold War, this was rooted in World War II. Of course, World War II changed the boundaries of a lot of countries. It allowed the formation of Yugoslavia, different things like that. But World War II took traditional conflict from artillery's arms and armament to ushering in the nuclear age of war. And that's why Albert Einstein once said, I don't know what World War III will be fought with, but I know World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones because the next huge huge conflict that engulfs the world will be a nuclear conflict that could potentially usher in nuclear winter, wipe out humanity, that kind of thing. But the fact remains here that with the Cold War, we got a series of proxy conflicts. So it was like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Soviet-Afghan War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, about a 13, 14 day hand. It goes about the closest the United States and Russia ever got to launching nuclear weapons against each other. But it was the USSR putting missiles in Cuba, which was a response to the United States putting missiles in Turkey. And so it was all these different things that were going on, the formation of the CIA and all that kind of stuff. The world was changing rapidly during the Cold War, but during the main Cold War itself, it was the space race, the race to get satellites and cosmonauts and astronauts into orbit, as well as the nuclear arms race to create as many nuclear weapons as possible so that if it came down to it, whoever had the most nukes would win. And so the idea here is that instead of Superman Red Sun saying, hey, here's the nuclear arms race, it's a superhuman arms race. And the reason why is because instead of Superman crash landing in Kansas when he was sent away from Krypton, he crash lands in Russia. Now, crash landing in Russia, again, it changes everything because now Russia has a super weapon in the form of what amounts to an indestructible man. The reason why this is so important and the reason why Mark Miller really did this is because it shows us how important and how powerful Superman is. Because when you think about it, you have Green Lantern, you have Hal Jordan, you have Wonder Woman, you have John Jones, you have a lot of these really cool characters. But back when Superman first showed up, he was the big kid on the block. There was no equivalent to Superman when he first arrived. And so what Mark Miller's doing is he's hard back to the golden age of comics when Superman first showed up and saying, he's the big guy here. Everybody else is second best. No one can go against the Man of Steel. The other half of this is we really get a change up for a lot of characters that we know and love. For example, Jimmy Olsen was well established to be a member of the Daily Planet, Superman's biggest fan in a lot of different ways. In Red Sun, he's part of the CIA. He's part of the government's intelligence organization, which actually grabs Lex Luthor and brings him in by way of Star Labs. Now again, this is a huge turning point, but in a lot of ways, it 
it also stays familiar. And the reason why I say this is because the dichotomy between Superman and Lex Luthor is like a hallmark. I mean, when people think of heroes and villains, when they think of like the arch nemesis of various superheroes, Superman is Lex Luthor, Batman is Joker. It's these great aspects that are timeless. I mean, the battle between Superman and Lex Luthor is timeless. They'll always be enemies. They'll always be villains. It's cool to see things change up for a little while. That's why DC Rebirth is so cool because we get good guy Lex Luthor from the New 52. But it's also one of the reasons why, you know, I think after Sal or somebody brought it up, a lot of us are hoping that like Mr. Oz in DC Rebirth is actually Lex Luthor from the pre-New 52 landscape because that would be super cool. But the fact remains here that Lex Luthor is very much obsessed with the idea of Superman. Not only that, he's still extremely smart here. Now, this is something else to keep in mind. Lex Luthor has red hair here. And the reason why is because when he first popped up in DC Comics, he was a redheaded guy. And so it was cool that it's just the small things that Mark Miller grabs and throws into the story, hearkening back to the original appearance of a lot of these characters. Lois Lane herself looks like classic Lois Lane from the golden age of comics, you know, or I guess really kind of the golden and silver age of comics. It's just the way these characters are depicted that really kind of show us how things looked back in the day. But what ends up happening here is Lex Luthor sits down, you know, of course, because he's basically been contracted by the CIA to work on behalf of the federal government to find a way to basically counter Russia's Superman. He says, we need our own Superman. I mean, if Russia's Superman is basically going around saving the world, but doing it on behalf of Russia, then he's making Russia look good in the eyes of the world. It's his continued expansion of communism as opposed to the United States policies of capitalism. We need our own equivalent. And so what he does is he calls the president and says, look, I need a Russian satellite to crash into Metropolis. If the Russian satellite comes crashing down, then what I'm hoping will happen is that Superman will fly to its rescue and he'll basically say whoever's there, he'll stop the satellite from crashing. And that's exactly what happens. I mean, it's what we'd expect. And that's kind of the cool thing here is the elevation of Superman from being a good guy to being this dictator that takes over the world is not overnight. It's a slow build. It's a slow flame. And that's why I love Mark Miller's stories because he's really, really good at starting with something simple and turning it into something extremely in-depth and extremely convoluted, especially when it comes to turning characters on their head. He's super good at that kind of thing. But the fact remains here that with Superman, with us seeing him really for the first time in full uniform, it's beautifully done. His costume as Red Sun is actually pretty badass, to be honest with you guys. I mean, I like it. <laughs> I really love the way that it looks, but it's still classic Superman in terms of how he acts. He hands a balloon to a little kid. He's saving the day, saving the iconic, you know, Daily Planet logo that comes crashing down from the building. But what we also get is this first encounter between Superman and Lois Lane. Now, again, Lois is the first lady of comics in my mind. It'll always be that way. She's the first lady of comics, the quintessential damsel in distress. She has no superpowers to speak of, but she's one of the most important characters in the history of comic books because she is what DC used to ground Superman. If it wasn't for her, he would just be an alien guy from another planet who looks human and has incredible powers. But falling in love with a vulnerable human who could be killed by any number of means, a bullet, a car that hits her too fast, falling from a building, she could die of a stroke. There's a lot of things that could kill Lois Lane. And so we have this, you know, vulnerable human being that could die any number of ways who is the heart of this virtually in destructible man, it creates this incredible dichotomy, this beautiful dichotomy. But we don't really get a tried and true Superman Lois Lane relationship here. Instead, Mark Miller just kind of teases with us. He's like, hey guys, wouldn't it be awesome if they got together? Well, they're not. <laughs> and it's really cool the way that it's done. But again, you know, Lois Lane is married to Lex Luthor here, but it's also very tenuous in the sense that Lex Luthor is not a tried and true guy. Now, transitioning from America over to Russia, we get this perspective, but we also learn that there's trouble in paradise here. The grass is not really greener on the other side. The people in Russia loves Superman because they save him from various things and it's really kind of like how people in America perceive Superman in DC Comics. But the other half of this is that Joseph Stalin has a son named Peter Roslov. Now Roslov is designed to be this Superman Red Sun allegory to Pete Ross who was really one of Superman's closest friends when he was in Smallville. So again we're going to get this recurring theme. We're going to get a Russian version of Lana Lang and so it's really cool how this works out. But Roslov is extremely jealous of Superman for a lot of different ways. You know first and foremost Roslov is an illegitimate son of Stalin. And Stalin had a lot of those. Stalin had sons where he'd have intercourse with women just randomly. They'd produce children and he would never really take care of them. He would just kind of be like, they're there, but he wouldn't really care. Roslov is one of those very few examples, at least in this story anyway, where Stalin actually took one of his illegitimate children in. Now, Roslov is head of the Commissaria, basically what's equivalent to the internal affairs or, or really the secret police. So he's just kind of like the captain of the police in uh, Soviet Russia. But the idea here is that in the eyes of Roslov, even if he is an illegitimate legitimate son. He's the biological son of Joseph Stalin. And so because of that, when Superman appeared on Earth, when he was basically taken in by Joseph Stalin and Stalin started doting over him and treating him like his real son, it created a lot of animosity between Roslov and Superman. 
in the sense that Roslov absolutely hates him. Now, this will start to change a little bit, but then Roslov's life is going to go to absolute hell here in a little while. But the fact remains that we actually end up transitioning to this great big, huge, grandiose party that's being thrown between Joseph Stalin and, and really, you know, Hippolyta from Themyscira or of the Amazons. Now, this is something else that I wanted to address here. When it came to the idea of communism in Russia, one of the crazy things here is that there's a lot of debates that go on right now between like, you know, communism and capitalism. People say, well, communism never works. Look at Russia. Well, Russia is not real communism. Russia had what was called vanguard communism. And what I mean here is during World War One, you had Leon Trotsky, you had Vladimir Lenin, you had a handful of guys who came in. They ushered in the Bolshevik Revolution where they cast out Nicholas the Tsar and his family, executed them all, including Anastasia, and basically just implemented their own brand of communism. The difference with this is that unlike Karl Marx's view of communism, where everybody adheres to the betterment of the state itself, and there are no people who are running the show, under Leon Trotsky, under Vladimir Lenin, under, you know, when Stalin took over and, you know, Lenin and Trotsky were effectively removed from the picture, we had this introduction of vanguard communism in the sense that you basically had like an inner party, you had a ruling party. And much like Nicholas the Tsar, they lavished themselves with all kinds of parties and wealth and extravagant things. And because of that, it created this continual idea of oppression. That's one of the reasons why Animal Farm continues to be one classic story because it basically says that the Russian people cast off one form of oppression for another form of oppression. So it was, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire. But the fact remains here that what we're getting is this really cool circumstance where it is uh, this continued expansion of the Superman Red Sun mythos in terms of how he deals with Russia, but also Wonder Woman. Now, Wonder Woman is a character where historically she's always had kind of like an on again, off again relationship with Superman. I mean, in truth, depending on who you talk to, a lot of people liked the idea of Wonder Woman and Superman getting together. But in my mind, that was just too easy. It was too convenient. You know, it's, it's too easy to pair two extremely iconic characters together because, you know, it's like putting a, a square peg into a square hole. Yeah, it fits, but sometimes we want what doesn't fit. Sometimes we want what just, you know, it just kind of cocks your head to the side and says, really? And that's why the Lois Lane Superman thing just went along so well. Plus, Lois Lane and Superman had been a thing for decades and decades and decades. Wonder Woman just didn't really seem to fit in there. But the idea here is that she's very enamored with Superman because she sees him in a lot of ways like herself. Wonder Woman is very strong. She's very powerful. She's very empowered. Superman is much the same way. Because of this, there's a lot of talk here that the two of them will basically have a coupling. They'll start a family and uh, they'll basically kind of create this allegiance, so to speak, between the Amazons and Russia. Now, this is a big deal because what we're talking about here is a huge expansion of Russia's influence into other parts of the world, especially when we consider the fact that the Mosquera in a lot of ways wanted to remain isolated. The fact that they're reaching out here and saying, hey, let's join the Russians shows that as an isolated country whose allegiance could go either way to the United States or to Russia, they're basically saying Russia's winning the race here. Now, this is where we start to get into the idea that there are consequences for everything, especially when it comes to the introduction of Batman. We won't see him until the next video, but the idea here is that Roslov had basically been missing from the party and Superman went to go find him. And when he found him, Roslov was just taking his irritation, taking his anger out, you know, with target practice. But the two of them have this sort of discussion where Roslov says, look, I hate you. You took my father's attention away from me and it was brought to you. And because of that, I will never be the son that he wants. You are the iconic son that he wants. And of course he says, you know, you're not even really human. I don't understand why you're here. And, and it's really just kind of an airing of grievances. The fact that he says that he hates him. Now, what Roslov also does is he talks to Superman about the assassination of a couple parents. And what he says is that these parents are basically printing anti-Superman leaflets. Now, of course, because Superman is a representative of the communist state, the secret police are harsh and they bring down wrath on anybody who is against Superman. It's the equivalent of printing leaflets and saying, down with Stalin, Stalin needs to die. Now, this is true. This is actually how Stalin ran communist Russia back then. If you went out and you ranted against the boss, they would have you killed. You'd disappear into a black bag somewhere and no one would ever see or hear from you again. Either you'd be executed, you'd be thrown into a work camp. I mean, there'd be a lot of things that would happen, but the fact remains, they would basically remove you from the equation. And so it was very much a culture of fear, much like Nazi Germany, because if people sat down and they had feelings that were against the government, they didn't know if the person they were talking to was a spy or if they were actually a person that shared the same kind of feelings they did. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of people just kind of kept their opinions to themselves. They were constantly terrified, you know, because imagine if you were walking around and you were saying, man, I really do not like the president of the United States. Now imagine if the person you were talking to, you didn't know if they were going to arrest you for saying that, or if they were going to be like, yeah, man, I feel the same way. That kind of fear is what gripped communist Russia, Nazi Germany. That's why those totalitarian governments are so feared. But the idea 
idea here is that there's consequences for everything in the sense that when Rossloff killed these parents, it was the equivalent of Joe Chill killing the parents of Bruce Wayne in the normal DC timeline. And so because of this, because of the fact that Rossloff allowed this young boy to run away and even went as far as to shoot him in the back, even though the fact that he lived, it sets the stage for this boy growing up to become Batman, to become this one person that speaks out and tries to bring down Superman's regime. But what Rossloff also says is that in his heinousness, in his anger, in his wrath, he's done so many terrible things. And he looks at Superman and says, in the eyes of the world or in the eyes of the Russian people, you're going to usher in a new age. You're going to save the world. But what he says is people like you don't do anything but bring pain among others. And this is a very good point because Rossloff is actually basically saying with absolute power, comes absolute corruption. A time will come when you're going to be forced with a choice. You're gonna to come to a fork in the road. You're gonna be at a precipice and you're going to have to make the choice between implementing something that basically forces totalitarianism, continues Joseph Stalin's views, or you're going to deviate and you're gonna go the other way and you're gonna create a culture of freedom. But regardless of which choice you make, one leads to absolute destruction of virtually everything, of all free will, free ideas. The other one will lead to the destruction of humanity because people will use that freedom to inevitably destroy themselves. And so he says, look, you're setting the world on a collision course. You're going to bring things crashing down around us. Now from here, we basically pick up with Joseph Stalin dying of cyanide poisoning. Now, the fact that Joseph Stalin is dying makes things even more terrifying for the United States. And the reason for this is because whether people are overtly saying it or they're whispering it in corners, most everybody has their eyes on Superman to be the successor. People are saying, look, we have this guy that literally saves people. I mean, it's not some leadership role. It's not he's saving people by being a moral leader. He's literally saving people by keeping buildings from exploding, by pulling people out of harm's way, being almost anywhere in the blink of an eye. He is a physical savior. At the same time, Lex Luthor had been continuing to work on basically cloning Superman. And so what we get is essentially this bizarro kind of Superman. And here's the funny thing. It's interesting when you think about bizarro Superman coming from the US because Superman is a homegrown character. He was created in Cleveland, Ohio. And so he is very much an American made superhero. He's representative of humanity, which is why he's so popular is because yes, he was made in America, but he's a reflection of what all people can aspire to be. So he's as much a reflection of the French and Russian and Canadian and German people as he is the United States, because with the exception of borders, most people think the same way and view the same things, value the same kind of things. But the idea here is that when we think of somebody creating a bizarro version of Superman, we don't think of the United States doing it. We think of somebody else doing it. And so it's kind of cool that we get this bizarro version of Superman that comes from us. The other cool thing, though, is that this is as close as we get to the traditional Superman that we all know and love in the sense that Superman 2, as is referred to by Lex Luthor, is basically sent over to encounter Superman and to basically take him out. Now, the two of them start fighting one another. The two of them start uh, engaging in battle with one another. And the battle is so extreme that the British actually panic and fire off a nuke. And so because of this, it's really the situation where with them fighting throughout Britain with the idea that Britain's kind of panicking, the Superman 2 actually sits down and actually makes a decision to sacrifice its life and save everyone. Now, this is something that we would expect the real Superman to do. The real Superman would sacrifice sacrifice his life if it meant saving as many people as possible. That's why he died in the fight against Doomsday. The Russian Superman was not nearly as quick to make that decision. Now, it doesn't mean that the Russian Superman doesn't care about people. It doesn't mean the Russian Superman cares less about people. All this is really Mark Miller doing is sitting down and saying, here is what the real Superman would do. Here's the difference between the traditional Superman in terms of his moral compass, his viewpoint, what it is that he wants to do, and the Red Sun Superman. And so because of this, with the death of this Superman 2, this destruction of it, as well as the death of Joseph Stalin, again, Again, everybody's looking at Red Sun Superman to be the one to take over the country, to be the one to lead everything. And of course, he even tells Rossloff, I don't want to be that guy. I do not want to be the leader of Russia. I do not want to be thrust in this position. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Now, from here, we switch back to Lois Lane. And again, this is Mark Miller hitting home at the idea that Superman and Lois Lane should be together, but they're not. Now, it's not super overt. It is kind of to a degree, but not in our face being plastered everywhere. It's really just Lois Lane sitting down and saying that she's had the same dream every night for almost her entire life, that Superman always saves her, that she's falling and Superman flies in and he saves the day. Now, of course, again, this is Mark Miller kind of teasing us saying, hey, look, this is how things are supposed to be. This is the direction things are supposed to go in, but they're not. It's not a perfect world here. It's not the Superman that we're used to. What we also get here is Lex Luthor calling up his wife, Lois Lane, and saying, hey, look, I'm getting a separation. I'm more or less putting our marriage on a hiatus. It's not an official divorce. You know, just because of the fact that even back then, divorces were looked at with very skewed eyes, especially with Lex Luthor being such a public figure, it would look extremely bad if he got 
divorce. And back then, if a woman was divorced by her husband, society at the time, as backwards as it may have been, would look at her and say, clearly she's failed as a wife. And so again, that's how people used to view things back then. But of course, Mark Miller's goal here is returning Lex Luthor to the traditional standard that we expect in the sense that he has an absolute hatred for Red Sun Superman, and he looks at him as the guy that basically ruined his life. Now, really, this is just him basically saying, hey, look, I want to take Superman out because one, he destroyed my creation, and two, because a creation that I made beat me in chess. But it's really just him saying, Superman's got to go. We got to find a way to get rid of him. Now, the way this first volume actually wraps up is with Superman effectively undertaking the mantle of becoming Russia's leader and beginning the process of taking over the world by an unlikely source. As he's going through and as he is flying around and looking for things to save people from, he actually comes across the Russian version of Lana Lang. Now, of course, this was his childhood sweetheart. And even in DC Comics and the traditional Superman origin stories, whether it's Jeff John's Superman, whether it is Alan Moore's Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow that touched on his origin, regardless of how it is, you know, Superman Birthright, all these origin stories remind us that Lana Lang played a very important role in Superman becoming the hero that we all know and love. But they also had this kind of romance for a time. And Superman talking to her comes to the realization that she's basically starving. Her family, they're not able to eat as well as they should because again, all the money that existed in Russia was being just kind of thrown away and spent on lavish parties by the ruling party. And so because of that, Superman sits down and says, okay, fine, then we're going to rescue them. We're going to save the day. We're going to tell people, you don't have to be scared. You don't have to be hungry. We're going to have an unrivaled era of peace. The problem with this is that the peace they experience effectively comes at the wrong end of a gun, at the business end of a rifle. And so, yeah, Superman's going to bring peace to Russia. He's going to bring peace to the world but it's going to cost everybody virtually everything that they want. It's going to cost them everything that matters. It's going to cost their free will. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explained and you guys want to see the second volume next week, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this, make sure you drop a like and uh, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys think because I'm curious. What version of Superman do you think is better? Do you think it's better to have a Superman that actually takes over the world? Like in terms of storytelling, I mean, do you think a story where Superman takes over the world is better than a story where Superman saves the world? Because I'm kind of curious. I personally like Dark versus a Superman. I like it where Superman's just like an evil guy because we're so used to him being a good guy, but I like evil Superman. I think it kind of works well, but in any event, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end and uh, yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.